Oh my god, there's a burger on the ground. I just met up with the guy from Real World React who organized the Stuff Hub workshop and he had some great news, some good news and some not so great news. The great news is that the payout is actually even bigger than I thought it would be. The good news is that StubHub already referred us internally inside eBay to another client in uh, Boston who wants me to do a workshop with them. Or well, they, don't, they want Real World React, but because it's me, they want me, I guess. The not so good news was that working with big clients like this is kind of shitty in that when they have internal payment rules, they just follow those internal payment rules, which means that they're probably gonna make us wait for something called Net30. And the problem with Net30 is that we already did all the work, now they get to wait 30 days before they pay us, because, because they can. So I guess we'll see. Now the question is, how do, we, how do I get to the point of having one of these every month, or at least one of these every two months? I don't think I can organize them myself, because I'm really bad at corporate sales. But if I can work with Real World React and get on their regular roster... Why would somebody just throw a burger on the ground? It's already Thursday and I still don't have enough video footage to make a vlog for this week. So let's talk about bad technical decisions and how they can come to haunt you for years. Did I say that too fast? Generally I would say that bad technical decisions come in three flavors. One flavor is the opportunity cost, where you don't realize you can automate something that you should really automate or just build a process for that's solidified in code. That's one way you can make a bad technical decision. The other way is where you ask a lot of how to do something instead of why doing something. This is very common with beginner programmers where, I wrote a post about this today called, called CV-driven development. The idea is that when you're new to the job, you look to the internet to decide how to do something. So you look for technologies, you look for ways that other people have solved some problem that you have, and instead of asking why they solved it that way, you just use whatever they use, because hey, they're the people you look up to, surely they make the right choice. Your small company is trying to, build, to run the same architecture as someone like Google, which makes it very expensive and over-engineered, so you don't want to do that. The third way you can make a bad technical decision is when you make a decision that makes a lot of sense at the time, and you build something that really works, then the situation changes a little tiny bit, and suddenly everything breaks down. Wow, that was a very polite security guard. He waited for me to finish talking into the camera before telling me I can't sit at that sign. The third way you make a bad technical decision is that you, you basically make a decision that looks good until it stops looking good. We had this situation at Yahoo a while ago where I built something. Um, I think I'm gonna need to, to draw some diagrams to, to explain this one. Okay, where was I? I think we can all agree about the opportunity cost bad decision. That's the first kind. You put, you put off doing something because it doesn't feel worth it and then by the time you do it, you realize you would have saved so much time that you should have just done it immediately. That's the easy kind. Now let me show you a little diagram of the CV, CV or resume driven development kind of bad decisions that people make. You start at a small company. You don't know exactly what you're doing so you look at blog posts and other stuff to get ideas to see what the big boys are doing. So you build a massive bloated solution. It's way too big, it's way over engineered, it does way too many things, but it kind of gets the job done. So you become an expert in all those technologies and eventually your small company becomes too small for you and you decide to go work somewhere else. You go work at a bigger company. With this bigger company you're now an expert in all these technologies so you build more bloated solutions. This company almost needs it, it's almost worth it. And you go to work at a gigantic company. Here all your solutions totally make sense. You build them there, you become a really big expert, you become famous and whatnot, and you're a gigantic expert in all these fancy technologies that everybody wants to use. But you realize that it doesn't quite scale to the hugeness of your company. So you start working on a new on a new technology and you create technology X. You build it as the most scalable, most useful, most awesome technology and it's amazing and it works really well at your scale. It feeds directly into all the little guys who are just starting out 
and these guys are now building gigantic solutions that are way over engineered okay so the diagram doesn't really make sense the idea is that you're choosing technologies, choosing what to build and how to build it based on what's good for your career. You become an expert, You, it works really well for your CV, but it doesn't so much work for your business or your employer. For you as an engineer, that's not a problem at all. It's perfect, it uh, gives you an excuse to play with cool technologies, it gives you an excuse to build your career, to build your CV, but your employer might be footing the bill for something they really don't, they just don't need it. And that's where having a CTO that's a stickler for reining in their engineers really kind of comes into play. The third type of decision that bites you in the ass is the kind that makes sense at the time and works perfectly until all of a sudden it doesn't work perfectly anymore. Etiop were one of those companies that does login with a code. You give us your phone number, we send you a code, you can, you can log in. The way that works is that we have a queue, right? and we put workers in the queue from this end we feed them in and here they pop out and get done right the way it works is that every time you log in we add a little packet or a little worker to our queue and eventually they get done that works perfectly but we also use this queue for a bunch of other things for instance for analytics so we create an a little analytics worker every time there is an event. This worker sends data to Mixpanel and until we had traffic this all worked perfectly, right? Until one day a bunch of little analytics workers and they were just, there were a lot of them. So when our little logging workers came in, the ones that send you a code, suddenly it would take five minutes and that is a problem people would then be like, oh wait, shit, I didn't get the code. So they would try again and try again and try again. And everything just kept backing up and backing up and backing up. All the way until we had 20,000, let's say it was 20,000. Till we had 20,000 little analytics workers. Oops, that's green, green is for analytics. Little analytics workers in front of all of our little code workers. This was a decision that totally made sense when I implemented it. If you want to have real-time analytics, it makes sense to every time you have an analytics event, you create a worker so that you send it immediately to Mixpanel and product and business people can immediately see what's going on, right? But in this case, it le because we were using the same queue for everything, it led to this problem of a huge buildup of workers which meant that people could no longer sign in. And obviously, if you have to wait five minutes to get your login code, you're probably not gonna give a shit anymore and you're not gonna log in. So, we started batching all of those workers together. So instead of having tens of thousands of workers per hour, we just had one every five minutes. You batch all of your little tiny analytics workers into one big worker, which is quicker to process. So the individual worker takes longer to process but overall it takes faster because there's less overhead in the in the workers which means that you can process all of your login workers or your code workers a lot faster and the result improved conversion by 19 percent 19 bloody percent just because we fixed a stupid decision I made maybe six months ago but it's important to say that you shouldn't beat yourself up about situations like this. It's an interesting learning experience and in retrospect, it, total, it sounds totally dumb to be creating a worker for every analytics event because there are so many of them. But at the time, our priority was get analytics fast. Our priority wasn't, oh shit, our queues are clogging up. So, you know, it's one of those things where in hindsight, you always feel dumb and like you made the stupidest possible decision. But usually, or most of the time, you made a really good decision with the information you had available at the time. But now I know never to do that again. How would you have prepared it? And that's how you prepare one of the most delicious things to have made it out of the Balkan.